So let's pretend that J.K. Rowling, one of the greatest authors of our time, came to me for feedback on her new wizard screenplay. I took a writing class one time, so I'm qualified. Well, overall, I did like Fantastic Beasts, which has nothing to do with me being a huge, obsessive Harry Potter fan. But right now I'm going to constructively talk about some issues I had with it and give feedback on how to fix it. Let's do it. By the way, oh my god, every spoiler. Don't watch this until you've seen it or decided you don't care. Problem number one, it had exactly as much filler as I was pretty sure it was going to. So watching the trailers, I was like, huh, I'm really excited to see more of the wizarding world. And like, it's cool that it's set in America. That's different. But hey, it kind of looks like a lot of this action is just chasing monsters around and trying to catch them while they make a lot of noise. It's a lot like the critically acclaimed masterpiece Lilo and Stitch the series, but trailers always put in like the action nonsense sequences, so you're like, oh, this movie has action. So I was like, I'm sure there's a lot more going on other than that. And there really wasn't. I feel like I'm like becoming an old lady and when I go to movies and they have one of those scenes where it's just like, stuff is getting wrecked and there's a fight. I'm always just like, here comes lots of noise and it just, I just feel like bombarded. I like sit back in my seat and I get all flinchy. It's like the cinematic version of sitting somewhere where there's like a person in front of you with a spray bottle and they're just spraying you in the face with this spray bottle. Uh, for like nine minutes. Like, I don't get it. Who likes that? Who's asking for those scenes? Ten-year-old boys. The answer is ten-year-old boys. Anyway, how am I gonna fix this one? Because the plot is just like Newt has to round up his creatures. In my reworking of the script, Newt says to his zany friends, oh no, my creatures are loose and I gotta go find them. They go on this madcap adventure through New York City. They're like following this trail of silly destruction. Nothing lethal, because it's like whimsical. And finally, this trail leads them to a little alley and... He goes inside and all of his creatures are just all together in one place, quietly resting in a consolidated pile. And he's just kind of like, oh, there they are. And he just opens his suitcase and that's it. And then the story can continue. And it's very quiet and, and peaceful. Number two, none of these locations are as magical as the Harry Potter films. So I do realize that Harry Potter had an unfair advantage because like they're books. So there's more room for stuff. For world building stuff. Also that was set at a school, one school for seven years, so you get to revisit the same locations over and over again. But also let's be real, like this setting is way less cool too. I mean like let's look at Harry Potter and acknowledge that even the really miserable places in the book are places that people would want to visit. You better believe that if Universal Studios had like a Malfoy Manor dining experience or like a Chamber of Secrets bounce house or the Voldemort Resurrection Cemetery taco truck pavilion, I would be there immediately and so would a lot of other people. I'm not sure I'm as stoked to visit magical places like 1920s Muggle New York Customs Office, US Wizard Government Building, Goldstein System, sister's two-bedroom apartment. Or who could forget Crazy Witch Hunter's Desolate Orphan Soup Kitchen. Could be a buffeteria style restaurant. I did think the wizard execution chamber was cool, but not in like a yay, let's go there kind of way. The thing is the Harry Potter films weren't just set in London, they were set in wizarding London, and this film is just set in New York and it's a version of New York that doesn't even have newsies. I mean, it definitely seems like the deliberate standout location was the inside of Newt's suitcase. And we've had bags with stuff inside of them in Harry Potter before. Like we had Hermione's purse that could fit a bunch of stuff. And there was that whole year where Mad-Eye Moody was trapped in a trunk. Probably not even the saddest year of Mad-Eye Moody's life. Anyway, they spent a long time showing us the interior of the suitcase, but the whole thing was like so CG heavy that you had no sense of like a real location at all. It also was bad because it kind of ruined the whole idea of Newt's conservation mission. Like, I don't know, it kind of looked like he had perfectly adequate space for all of his creatures right in the suitcase, and he didn't have to go anywhere and do anything. I mean, it's the suitcase that seems to have shifting walls and no borders, and it has perfect magical replicas of their exact natural environment. And they all seem really happy and safe and stuff, and like not getting attacked by poachers. I get that the suitcase is supposed to equal zoo enclosure, where you're like, it's nice, but it's not the wild. But it kind of is. Because like even a really nice zoo, their limitations usually just going to be space. Like space is limited, space is expensive. But space is not an issue here. Unless like you mean to tell me that Newt Scamander can have a suitcase with a five acre interior, 
but six acres is silly and impossible. And if it is, he could just get another suitcase. Maybe suitcases like that are expensive, but you know what else is expensive? A voyage to America. Anyway, here's how we're gonna punch up the locations, according to me. So we're gonna set the film entirely in Coney Island. If you want, you can still have the characters just refer to it as New York City. Just kind of willfully pretend that you think New York City is just Coney Island and you're confused. You're British, so nobody's gonna get on your case about it. Maybe you could reveal that when the park closes at night, it like becomes wizarding New York. Like that's where everyone goes to buy their wizard stuff and hang out with wizards. So you don't have to compete or invite comparison with wizarding London, but you're also just like casually totally making something a lot better. Like, oh, Diagon Alley's nice and doesn't have a Ferris wheel. People love theme parks, especially vintage ones. Like, even if you're not there, it's cool to look at them. And hey, you know what's easy to replicate for a Universal Studios theme park? Another theme park. The ride concepts basically write themselves because they're just the rides. Number three, the creatures didn't actually look that good. This movie had like a lot of CGI. A couple of the creatures looked fine. I mean like the snake looked fine and the rhino looked fine. And I don't know if that's because their skin is like easier to replicate or because they just had different lighting conditions. But there was that one character, the Niffler, who was basically just like an echidna and it just looked like a fake echidna. I get that you can't use a real animal, really, because it has to like have this range of emotions and do crazy stunts, but I don't know. Something looked wrong. Maybe make it look less like a real animal or something. Like it very rarely felt like it was actually a thing in the same room as the actors. Also, there was like a goblin, and the goblin was CGI. Was Warwick Davis busy? And you hate giving dwarves work? Was he at least like voiced by a dwarf? Since the movie is so creature heavy, this is again not an easy problem to fix. I would say they could just use puppets or animatronics, but that costs money and it's hard. Instead, I think they should just pressure Joe to create creatures that are a lot like normal creatures. Eddie Redmayne's like, it's a south, it's a southeastern scrog thumper. His silly befuddled friend is like, I don't know what that is. Eddie Redmayne's like, whoa, it's a cat. But instead of two eyes, it's got a big cyclops eye in the middle of its face. Just glued right on there. Just putty. Looks like putty, but it, it's an eye. That's part of the creature, is that it looks fake. Another creature is like an octopus that has oven mitts on its arms. Look out. Oh no. If they absolutely don't want to cast a dwarf, then they could just get a normal guy to be the goblin. He just walks in, he just looks like a normal guy, but the characters go, it's a hideous goblin. He's gonna take all your money, cause he's a greedy goblin. Look at his scary, pointy teeth, his beady little eyes. It's just a really unlucky extra that was on set that day. Number four, the twists aren't really twists. So I get that Harry Potter has an unfair advantage because it's a book and there's more in it. So you can just seamlessly blend in clues with world building stuff and nobody knows that they're being fed clues. So they don't figure stuff out as easily. In a movie, you say something to the audience and they go, why did you say that to me? And they start figuring stuff out. Harry Potter also had Harry serving up some heavy confirmation bias in his narration. So he'd see something happening and he would immediately start speculating to us about why that might be, which is not the same as being an unreliable narrator, by the way. Like that's not what that term means. He's just a bad detective. So Ezra Miller was obviously the Obscurio or obscurus, obscurious. I feel like all of those are right and they each mean like different forms of the same word. I've only seen the movie once, so. Anyway, it was obviously him because we were spending the most time with him. Everyone that was killed by the obscurus was shown wronging him and he was shown being angry about it. And Newt had that line like, usually they're 10 or younger, which to me just like confirmed it because it was so obviously there to throw you off the scent. The twist wasn't like, oh my God, he's the obscurus. It was like, why did Colin Farrell not know that he was the Obscurus. The twist was that Colin Farrell is dumb. What movie was he watching? Speaking of Colin Farrell, I knew he was gonna be Grindelwald. And apparently there are a lot of like clues in posters that I didn't look at and in the visuals of the movie, which I didn't see because for like the first 50% of any movie, I'm just looking at my popcorn and enjoying eating the popcorn, thinking about how I want to get a free refill on my large popcorn. So like, I didn't see any of the concrete evidence people have been talking about, but I did notice that Colin Farrell seemed very evil. And also that one time he just like, just had a necklace of the Deathly Hallows logo. I got this for you at Hot Topic, Ezra, and it's gonna make you feel better by alerting your mom that you're sympathetic to magic users so that she'll beat you more. So allow me to fix this. My twist, 
is that Colin Farrell is a good guy, and he just makes dumb decisions sometimes, and it's not his fault. He's trying his best, you guys. And his wife just had a baby, and he isn't getting a lot of sleep. And that baby's name is Madame Rose Murta. Madame is her first name, and Rose Murta is her middle name, and she goes by both of them. What does it mean? I don't know, because there's no real connection. But one character was related to another character whose name you've heard before. And that means that's a twist. Mind blown. Number five, Ezra Miller just oozes miserable slime from every part of his face. I did really like the casting in this movie. People are always like really mean to Eddie Redmayne and I feel like he's been good in everything I've seen him in. Maybe not good, but he's tried really hard. I like when actors just like try really hard, even if they're in a really stupid movie. I don't know who any of these other people are, but they like worked as their characters. Tina was probably my favorite character. And I think Ezra Miller is great. Ezra Miller also gives it his all when he's crying. He just, whenever he's crying, you see like a trail of liquid coming out of his face. You can't tell if it's from his eyes or his nose or his mouth. It's just really gross to look at. Just a trail of slime from some th something. I get that if you can cry really intensely and unselfconsciously as an actor and just push slime out of your face, that that means you're a really good actor. But it's gross and if I was the director, I would just say, like, just don't do that. Ezra, don't do that. Please, just don't do that. That's my solution. Number six, I have one problem with the casting. So I just said I liked the casting in this movie, and there's one notable exception. And it's bad enough that you probably already know who I'm talking about. So as I said before, I figured out pretty early on that Colin Farrell is Grindelwald. And I was kind of like, yeah, this is good. This is perfect. Good actor good-looking face. Get it, Dumbledore. And I liked Voldemort, but now we have a villain who's like a little subtler. He's very reserved, and you kind of feel some humanity from him there. Like, he very much believes in his ends justifying his means. And then, like a real-life horror movie, his face melts away and reveals this leering, heavily made-up Johnny Depp face. He's all looking like a bleached-out, vengeful clown. I'm a very reactive film watcher, and I was just like, no! And I wasn't even alone here. I heard a bunch of other people, like, groaning. Someone booed. The guy behind me was like, oh, come on. Like, yeah, I agree. Like, not to be mean, but I'm kind of like, Dumbledore endangered the whole wizarding world for this? He looks like when Judge Doom from Who Framed Roger Rabbit turned into a tune. But then when they're like, he's a tune, he like turns to them and goes, actually, incredibly, I am supposed to just be a normal man. I don't know, people have always given Johnny Depp a hard time for being over the top. And I've always been one of those idiots that's like, well, he's good as Jack Sparrow though, leave him alone. But like, it's kind of awkward watching someone like mug and, and flail around and do silly voices when he allegedly punches his wife in the face and verifiably has like kicking, screaming, violent wine bottle throwing tantrums drunk in like the morning. Like you see him in Finding Neverland and you're like, oh, he never grew up. And then you see him in the leaked footage and you're like, oh my God, he never grew up. It's awkward cause like this is a done deal. Like even if people react poorly, you can't just write out Grindelwald He's already like the big bad guy for this time period. Well, as always, I've got a solution. So, Fantastic Beasts 2, which I hope is called the Monster Book of Monsters. Clearly the better textbook. There's like an establishing scene of Grindelwald in wizard jail. It shows his face and his face morphs from Johnny Depp into Colin Farrell or like another actor. It's disguises on disguises. Now that's a good twist. Number seven, the stakes are extremely low. So until the Grindelwald twist, our main villain is the orphan-raising, witch-hating muggle lady. I was like, that's cool. We never have muggle villains in Harry Potter. And then I was like, oh, the reason we don't have muggle villains in Harry Potter is that muggles can't do anything to wizards. I mean, I guess the Dursleys hurt Harry psychologically. The witch haters have Salem in the name, which I assume is supposed to be scary, but canonically in Harry Potter, the witches getting burned at the stake in Salem were just casting tickling charms on themselves and were impervious to the flame and thought it was funny. So that kind of detracts from the seriousness of the threat. The highest stakes scene is when Tina and Newt are about to get straight up melted in acid. And that was weird, because you're like, oh, I guess in the American ministry, 
Just one guy in a little cubicle can be like, execute this former agent and also do it right now. And it doesn't need to be approved by anybody and will just be unquestioningly carried out by nice people who both knew and liked the suspect. Like, why did Tina want to go back to working there at the end of the movie? Did this not make things awkward? Actually, there's a lot at the ministry that doesn't make sense. The wizards can't let muggles find out about wizards because it would, like, upset the status quo. The muggles would, like, hurt their own feelings if they knew the truth. Like, I get that the initial widespread panic would be, like, bad news for everybody, but it's just hard to be nervous when Newt is, like, in the bank or the jewelry store when you know that if he was really in trouble, he could just magic himself out of whatever bind he's gotten himself into and then erase the memories of everybody who remembers it. I guess if it's a lot of muggles, it would take a long time. And that's inconvenient. This would be really bad if information could spread exponentially in seconds, like via the internet, but Fortunately, it's set in the 1920s, so that's not an issue. I like the end when the wizard president is just like, oh no, we can't erase all these muggles' memory. There's like a thousand of them and like a hundred of us, and I'm tired. We're just all gonna die. But it turns out there's a fix for that too. Newt like gets out his giant eagle. It's like Buckbeak, but it's not a horse, so it's less special. Newt goes like, I was gonna wait uh, until we got him to his natural habitat. But it's not a big deal. I'll just let him, let him out now. And then majestic music plays and we watch a whole montage about how Newt's entire journey was pointless. He didn't need to come to America and the movie didn't need to happen because I guess that eagle would have been fine anywhere. So now let's fix this. We know that Muggle Witch Hater Lady doesn't pose a threat to our wizards, but she can still be scary because she is dangerous to all the orphans that are under her thumb there. They could have just played that up a little more. And to do so, they'd want to develop more of the kids' personalities than just Ezra Miller. Like, as many as possible would be ideal. You could give them all silly New Yorker accents to make them more endearing. Maybe have, like, one of the short ones have to get around on a crutch so people feel more sympathy for him. Then give these kids their own agency. Have them express discontent with the situation that they're in and try to get out of it. Give them dreams. Maybe one of them wants to go out west, which is a beautiful parallel to how Eddie Redmayne wants to get his eagle out west to Arizona. These kids are resourceful, and eventually one of them has the idea to start a union. Until they get benefits, they are not passing out any more pamphlets. The witch hater is furious because with all these kids on strike, she can't keep telling people how witches are evil. Now maybe the director can add in some singing and dancing to make this all more stimulating. The witch hater bows to the pressure and gives in to the kids' demands. And then immediately afterward, she is killed by an Obscurio. Anyway, those are my solutions. I mean, the good news is we're getting more wizard movies. I think the sequels could be really fun. So was ending on an extended Newsies joke like a bad call? Because I could kind of feel while it was happening that it was a bad call. But I couldn't stop myself. And I'm gonna leave it in. I can feel it. So that's everything. Bye! The moral of this movie is that you should protect wildlife and their rights, but if they can help you in some way, just put them in New York. They'll be fine. They already owe you for saving them, so even if he gets hit by a plane, karmically you're coming out on top. Accio, biased review.